<laughs> I'm really good friends with his children, and Facebook does wonderful things. Um, okay. Wow. He served in churches large and small, from inner city Harrisburg to Wellsboro, which is the middle of nowhere, for those of you that aren't sure where Wellsboro is. Um, then he spent six years in Nashville at the Board of Discipleship, in charge of youth and young adult ministry. Then he returned to Wesley Church in Bloomsburg, um, where he was my pastor as a teenager. After a stint as the conference council director, doing all kinds of things around our conference, he's now the district superintendent of Lewisburg area. Growing up, youth fellowship was really significant in his life, and he learned how to dance at his church from the associate or from the youth pastor because the head pastor said it was a sin to learn how to dance. His favorite hymn is "When Peace, When Peace Like a River." And he has challenged all his churches in the Lewisburg area to think about who in their church might be called into ministry. So welcome Tom this evening. It is really great to be here. I consider this uh, God's call probably the most important event that the Susquehanna Conference does. Because I believe there's nothing more critical than working with both teens and young adults about what God is calling you to do and to be. So would you join me in prayer? May the words that I speak, O oh God, and may the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And O oh God, if in these moments I stumble and do not make sense, May folk know that that is me and not you. But if, O oh God, through your spirit, something is said that might touch a heart, may everyone know that that is not me speaking, but that is you, and we will give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to do uh, two particular things in the next three hours. <laughs> It'll just seem like three hours. But, but I want to talk about the call, God's call, but in two specific ways. One is I want to do some general thoughts with you about call and issues surrounding call. And then in the last bit, I want you to think very specifically about what's going on in your life. To frame our discussion, I'd like to share with you three scriptures. The first from the Gospel according to Mark. Passing along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and his brother Andrew net fishing. Fishing was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask any questions. They dropped their nets and they followed. A dozen yards or so down the beach, he saw the brothers James and John. They were Zebedee's children. They were in a boat mending their fishnets right off. He made the same offer. Immediately they left their father Zebedee and the boat in the hired hands. <coughs> And they followed him. And then in chapter 2, this little bit. Then Jesus went again to walk alongside the lake. Again, a crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. Strolling along, he saw Levi. He was at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. And he came. Then the second... Uh, scripture lesson comes from Jeremiah. This is how Eugene Peterson translates some of the verses in the first chapter. This is what God said. Before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, before all of that, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nations, that's what I had in mind for you. 
But Jeremiah said, hold it, Master God, look at me. I don't know anything. I'm only a boy. And God told me, don't say I'm only a boy. I'll tell you where to go, and you'll go there. I'll tell you what to say, and you'll say it. Don't be afraid of a soul. I'll be right there looking after you. God's decree. Well, God reached out, touched my mouth, and said, Look, I've just put my words in your mouth, hand delivered. See what I've done? I've given you a job to do. And then the third is, is one of my top five favorite scriptures. Yeah, I'm going to give you the RSV version, the revised Saul's giver version. <laughs> it's from the Old Testament. And it's about a man named Jonah. You know the story. Jonah had a conversation with God, and God said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to this place called Nineveh, and there I want you to preach. Well, Jonah really didn't want to do it. But he said, okay, God, I'll go. And so Jonah made his way down to the dock. And when he got there, there were two boats, two signs, one pointing this way to Nineveh and one pointing this way to Tarshish. And so there is Jonah. He said, God, I'll go to Nineveh. But lo and behold, he took the other boat. He thought he could run from God, and so he went to Tarshish. Except what happened was, as you know, in the middle of that voyage, there was a great storm. People were really upset, and as they began to talk, they asked Jonah who he was, and he, in essence, said, well, I'm running from God. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll, we'll try and, and keep going through this storm. And finally, you know what happened. Someone had to go overboard. It was Jonah. So Jonah went over, and you know the story. He got swallowed by this big fish, and he lived there for three days, not the most pleasant place. And in the middle of that belly of that big fish, God and Jonah had some conversations. I'd love to know what those conversations were. But you know, the fish threw him up. He made his way, and he went then to Nineveh to preach. Jonah knows what God wants him to do. God wants him to go to Nineveh, so Jonah says okay, but he gets in the boat and goes the other way. The truth, as I look at those three scriptures, is that God has a claim on all of our lives. God has a claim on all the lives that God created, and God expects us to say yes. The problem is, often we struggle. And some of you are struggling now because when God calls, many of us say, no, not me, not ever. Or we pretend to follow God, but we go merrily on our way, doing what we want, when we want, either thinking that God will somehow forget about us, or God will forget about our call, or God will choose someone else, someone who looks like a minister, whatever that looks like. Someone who is more holy, more religious. Many of us say, many of us either just give up or we go the other way when God calls. God, however, has a radical expectation, I think. God expects that God, when God calls us to do something, God expects us to say yes and that we do it. It's radical, but the pages of the Old and New Testament are full of examples of people who heard God's call and said, yes, you already heard in the book of Mark, Samuel, Samuel and Andrew, James and John, Levi, they left their businesses. Esther. Esther was an obedient and loving queen in the Old Testament. But she heard God speak through this man named Mordecai. And she took her life in her own hands and went to talk to the king. There's a, a woman... The Samaritan woman wasn't a, a woman. She was a woman that had had seven or eight husbands. And the one she was living with wasn't who she was married to. She went to gather water in the middle of the afternoon in the heat of the day because she was so mistreated by the people in the community. That's the only time she could go. And there she met Jesus. 
And after she had met him, she ran back to town and announced to the very people that had shunned her that she had met the one who told her everything about herself, and he still loved her. People of the Old and New Testament heard God's call, and they responded immediately. Well, that's happened through history. St. Francis of Assisi, he was a man of immense wealth, but gave it all away to serve the poor. There was a woman in England, Elizabeth Gurney Fry, uh, who lived in the late 1700s, 1800s. She was the wife of a wealthy mer uh, London merchant. But she took the ostracism of society and she reformed the prison system in England. There's a woman, Dorothea Dix, in the 1800s. She had a very comfortable life, but she heard God, heard her to be concerned about mental illness. Because at that point, People who were deemed to have mental illness went to prison. And it was because of her that there were special hospitals where people were loved and cared for. Dr. Fred Craddock, who is a preacher and was a seminary professor, tells a story that he was preaching one day. And after that sermon, a young woman came to the chancel rail and shook his hand and said, Dr. Craddock, I heard your sermon today, and I've decided I'm in the third year of medical school, but I'm quitting today, and I'm going to work with the migrant workers in the Rio Grande Valley. Well, Fred Craddock said, uh, let's go have lunch. We better talk about this. And over lunch, he said to her, do you realize how critical we need doctors? Do you know what you could do being a physician? And she said, I understand that, but I heard God call my name today. And God told me not to finish. Well, Fred went home, and the next morning when he came into the office, there was a man and woman waiting for him. You know, it was her parents. And they said to Fred, do you know what you have done? Do you know that has been her life's dream? And they talked about it. And finally, Fred said, I said all of that to her, but she heard a higher voice calling her to whom she owes her allegiance and to whom she must listen. It was the late, uh, it was early 80s. I took, I am old, 60 years old. I took a group of you from the inner city and we went to the Redbird Mission. And there we met a woman that was in her late 60s, early 70s. And one of our youth said to her, so you've been a missionary all your life? And she said, no. When I was in high school, I heard God call my name. He wanted me to, God wanted me to be a missionary. She said, but I said to God, well, just wait till I finish school because I was accepted into business college. So she said, I went and I became an executive secretary and I heard God call my name again, but I was in love and I said to God, wait till I'm married and we have children. And she said, I just never answered the call. My husband died. She said, I needed to work a couple of more years to be comfortable. And she said, they found a lump in my breast and I went to the hospital. They removed my breast. I had cancer at 63. She said, in that hospital bed, I heard God call my name again. And she said, I thought, okay, God, I've got you. Who wants me? I've got cancer. I don't know if I'm going to live or not. She said, I went home six weeks after my doctor's appointment. I wrote a letter to the Board of Global Ministries saying, I'm a secretary. You probably can't use me. I've got cancer. I don't know if I'm cured or not. She said, three months after my treatment, I sold my condo. And I went to the mission field in Redbird Mission. She said, because when God called, I kept running. But God called me for over 40 years until I finally gave in. Jonah heard the call and ran the other way, but there are those who have responded. Well, there, there are a couple things. I can't answer for you about your call, and, and you can't answer for me, but, but I think there are four quick truths about God's call and our response. The first truth is that the God whom we worship can and will make a claim on our life. It's impossible to sit in worship week after week, to go to Sunday school or youth group, to be in small groups, to go to church camp and not have God 
lay a claim on our life. So many people think that being a Christian is like belonging to, to some American Express Club. You've seen the commercials, you know, for the credit cards that with this card comes privileges. Being a Christian isn't about having special privileges. It's about following God where God would have us go. We can't go through life hurling our demands at God like those kids did in November sitting on Santa's lap and not expect God to have a claim on our life. The second, the second truth about the call of God is that it's unsettling. The call of God always disrupts our life and pulls us in directions we'd rather not go. John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist, you know, Methodist Church, wrote these words. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy and honorable. Others are difficult and disgraceful. Some suit our natural inclinations, but others are contrary to both. In some we may please Christ and please ourselves, but in other works we can only please Christ. The call of God is unsettling. The third truth is that, in, at least in my life, the call of God comes when things are going smoothly. In my own life, every time God has called me to move, it was when I really didn't want to. In my life, I was in a parish and there was some difficult times. I had loved it, but we had hit this time where it was just awful. And I just kept saying, God, it's time to move. But it wasn't until we got all of that work out that God called me. There was another time, you had heard we lived in Nashville. We owned our own home. We were there for six years. We loved that home. Our kids loved the school. There was only one thing we wanted to do, and that was change the kitchen. And the last thing we wanted to do was put in a new floor. And I'll never forget, it was New Year's Eve, 1992. We put the tile blocks in, and we had to hurry up because we were having a New Year's Eve party. We put the last block in, and my wife Joanne said, that's it. We're going to move this year. And I said, no, we're not. Uh, we've got plans. And she said, just when we get things the way we want it, God calls us to move. The fourth is that God will call you when you're young. If you're a chaperone here and not so young, God will call you in middle age. And God will call folk when they're retired. God is no respecter of age when it comes to our being called. There's a story of a woman who when she was young, people said she will do great things for God. When she became middle-aged, they said she can do great things for God. And when she became old, they said she could have done great things for God. If you have heard the call of God in your life, if you're feeling a nudge, I hate to tell you, but it's no longer possible to sit on the sidelines waiting for a better offer to come along. We're not like professional athletes who can dicker for higher pay. The kingdom and the one who proclaims it has spoken, and God demands a response from us. So, how do we hear the call of God? Have you heard the call? I want to suggest a couple of things. For some, the call is crystal clear. It's, it's they heard God's voice, but you've heard several people already tonight say, ain't never happened to me. I've never heard God hit me over the head and say, you will be a pastor. But there are some things I know. We can hear the call by listening for it. Scripture says, be still and know that I am God. For many, it's a slow process of coming to acknowledge. It starts by listening. The second way we listen to God is through prayer and through Bible study and meditation. If we don't listen for Christ's call through those disciplines, then we'll never hear it. The third is exactly what Stephen said a little bit ago. It's to talk with people. To listen and talk with pastors or the youth director or others. 
about what you're feeling in your life. And the fourth is I believe we hear the call of Christ through the needs of others. If we attune ourselves to the needs of others, we will hear Christ call us. Bishop Clay Lee was a bishop in the United Methodist Church down in the southeast. And there's a story he tells about a church in Atlanta that had ministry with mentally challenged adults. There was one woman in that church named Abby who was not only mentally challenged, she had epileptic seizures. The seizures could be minimized if someone would simply sit with her, put their arm around her, call her by name and say, it'll be okay, Abby. Well, there was a young man who that was his ministry. When he saw a seizure about to occur, he called her name and soothingly talked to her. Well, that young man was killed in an automobile accident. On the day of his funeral, Abby asked the minister, who will now put their arm around me? And who will tell me it will be okay? There are Abbeys in your community and mine who need for you and me to put our arms around them and tell them we care. When we serve others, we will hear the voice of God. My favorite movies are movies where there are car chases, where things get blown up. <laughs> But Joanne, my ah. wife, took me, and I must admit, kicking and screaming about a year ago to see the movie Blindside. Do you remember it? Have you seen it? And if not, I really recommend you rent it. It's a truthful story about a couple, Lee and Sean, and their two children who adopted a homeless teen. In an interview in People Magazine about eight, ten months ago, these Christians said, we didn't start out to adopt a teenage homeless kid. We live by an informal notion we call the popcorn theory. You can't help everyone, but you can try to help the hot ones who pop up right in front of you. There are children and youth, women and men who are living in tremendous need, physically, mentally, financially, emotionally, who need us. God very well may call you when you're working with those hot ones who pop up in front of you. Well, those are some things about call in general. But now I want to get personal. I want to talk and challenge you specifically for each one of us. And so, uh, is it possible to turn the lights up a little? And Warren, uh, and I think maybe someone else, going to hand out two things. One, uh, there is a little mirror that I would like you to have, and then there is a sheet uh, with John Wesley's words on it. As they hand it out, I would ask that particularly youth and young adults make sure you get one, and the chaperones. If you're a leader, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to share. And if someone would help Michelle... Uh, hand out the mirrors. You're alluded to the fact that I'm old. I'm excited because Joanne, my wife, and I are going to be grandparents for the first time. Now, one of the things, yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool too. But, but one of the things I did over Christmas was go through all of our DVDs and uh, our VHS uh, uh, videos to see what are the ones that I want to show this grandson with he's able to watch. There's one uh, that you will remember, and hopefully we've got a clip. It's uh, the Lion King. And there is a point at which Simba is off by himself, and he's struggling. So let's watch this clip, hopefully.
Uh, let, me, let me tell you this, this clip. You rem if you remember, Scar was the, the bad uncle that caused Simba's dad, the great king, to be killed. Well, at that point, Simba left uh, the pride and was out finding himself. At this particular point, if, you were, if we could see the clip, he's looking in a pool of water. He had just come uh, and met the young uh, lioness who had been his friend. And they were talking. And she said, where have you been? And he said, I'm out on my own. Life on my own is great. Akuma Matata. And she said, but we in the pride really need you. But he says, but you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've been through. And then he goes off and in this pool of water, he sees his reflection. But then the water changes and he sees the reflection of his father, the great king. And his dad looks up through the water through this reflection. You are my son. I live in you. You and I are the reflection of God. God lives in you. You are God's son and you are God's daughter. So if we could have the lights up, in the quietness of, of just a couple of minutes, look at your reflection. You are the reflection of God. You are God's child. It doesn't matter where you've been. God looks at this reflection. And I believe God says what God said to Jeremiah. God calls you by name and says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. Don't say, I'm only a boy or a girl. Don't say, I don't know what I'm going to say. Because God says, I'll tell you where to go and you'll go there. I'll tell you what to say and you'll say it. Don't be afraid of the soul. I'm right there looking after you. Your reflection is a reflection of God, and God says, I love what I made. And I have created you for a purpose. For some, it is the purpose of ordained ministry, to work in a church. For some of you, it might be to be ordained as a deacon to service. For others, it, it might be a youth pastor or a children's worker. But God has called you. It may not be clear, but what is clear is that God has created you for a purpose. And as you think about the grappling in your life, of what God has called you to do. I invite you to look at Wesley's covenant service that we handed out and hear these words. Commit yourself to Christ as Christ's servants. Give yourself to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. It means that God's going to call you. And some are going to be easy and honorable. Others are difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to your inclinations and interests. That means 
you love what it is, but there are going to be others that are contrary to what you love. In some, we're going to please Christ and we'll please ourselves, but in others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. And so, together, as a concluding of this time together, I invite us to pray this covenant prayer. It doesn't mean that you're saying absolutely positively, I know what God wants from me. But we are saying, God, whatever it is, as you help me understand, then I'll do it. So, let us pray together. I am no longer my own, but thou. Put me to what thou wilt. Grant me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee, or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. 